Hello, everyone. My name is James W. Gesso. Welcome to Adventures Through the Mind. This is a podcast that offers unedited, long-form interviews on topics relevant and related to psychedelic culture, medicine, and research, always with the underlying inquiry of how can we work with and through our psychedelic experiences to become better people, individually and collectively. This episode features an interview with Dr. Andrew Gallimore. This is the second time he has been on the show. The first time was back for episode 101 uh, with an interview titled DMT Aliens and the Meaning of Life. Much of that interview was exploring his uh, book Alien Information Theory and his uh, at the time recently developed protocol for extended state DMT now called DMTX. Um, in that interview, uh, my notes, yes, uh, we explored DMTX, the structure of reality, hyperdimensional alien intelligences, and the implication of dying while on DMT. In this interview, we're going to be exploring the topics of his new book, Reality Switch Technologies, Psychedelics as Tools for the Discovery and Exploration of New Worlds. We discuss how the brain builds an experiential world model from patterns and information at the neural level, how all of those worlds are correlated to specific neural patterns, and how we can disturb that neural pattern to encounter new worlds. Essentially, how we can use psychedelic molecules to explore new and alternate worlds. We discuss how different classes of psychedelic molecules affect the brain differently, differently, excuse me, and thus switch us to different potential worlds, uh, focusing most specifically on the uh, classical psychedelics. So this is like DMT, LSD, psilocybin, but we also go into tropane, excuse me, the tropane alkaloids, uh, datura, mandrake, henbane, etc. And we also explore ketamine. In the midst of that, we also discuss why the brain doesn't care if its models are true only if they're adaptive, how perception of reality flows from conceptual hypotheses downwards, not from sensory information upwards, the self model and its disintegration, aka ego death, schizophrenia and hearing voices, and how all experiences are real, but not all experiences are accurately mapped to our environment. So that's the content we're going to explore today. Who is Dr. Andrew Gallimore? I'm glad you asked. Dr. Gallimore is a computational neurobiologist, pharmacologist, chemist, and writer who has been interested in the neural basis of psychedelic drug action for many years and is the author of a number of articles and research papers on the powerful psychedelic drug NN-dimethyltryptamine, DMT. He's also, as mentioned just before, the author of Alien Information Theory and the book we're discussing in this episode, Reality Switch Technologies. He was also responsible for working with pioneering psychedelic researcher Dr. Rick Strassman, who who wrote the book DMT, The Spirit Molecule, um, in developing the extended state DMT protocol called the uh, Target Controlled Intravenous Infusion Protocol for Extended Journeys in the DMT Space, which is essentially a way in which he used the, or they use the technologies that anesthesiologists use to keep people at a certain blood plasma level of anesthetics to keep them sedated during surgery and applied that to DMT to help people stay in DMT spaces for not just the couple of minutes that a sort of a natural experience would be if you smoked it, uh, for example, but to be in it for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour. So that's who we're talking with today. As always, this podcast is brought to you by listeners like yourself who choose to voluntarily support the production of this show and the various content around it by financially contributing to it. Primarily, this is through Patreon, and I just thank my patrons so much for helping me continue to have this be 
my job. This be my enterprise in the world. <laughs> enterprise, I just thought of Star Trek. That's aside. Um, I'm a big Trekkie. Anyways, um, thank you, patrons. <laughs> thank you, patrons, especially the names of the people who are listening on the screen here uh, who give significantly, some of which for a long time, their names are also in the description to this episode. Um, if you're finding value in the show and you're not yet a patron or you haven't ever uh, donated or you're feeling just called in some way to be like, wow, I really want to support James's work. I like this show. That'd be great. Thank you. Uh, you could do so by becoming a patron or leaving a one-time donation. Links to do so are in the description to this episode wherever you're checking it out. If you are not in a place where financial contribution makes sense for you at this time, please know that there are other ways to support the show, such as liking this video on YouTube or subscribing to the show or to the channel, sharing it on your social media feed, even just talking to a friend about it, like getting these ideas out in the world. Um, so please feel free to give back in that way if financially it doesn't make sense to do so. But that's all for the intro to this episode. Please enjoy my interview here with Dr. Andrew Gallimore on Adventures to the Mind, episode 176. Andrew Gallimore, welcome to Adventures to the Mind for the second time. It's good to be back. Thanks for having me again, James. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm I'm really excited because uh, you you know you reached out said hey I just you know released this new book do you want to give it a give it a go and I'm like yeah yeah what recommended chapters do you have okay cool I'll read the introduction I got through the introduction and I was like I'm reading this whole book uh, and I did and I really enjoyed it um, now mind you I don't think I have enough of a background in this in the grand like this the very fine granularity in neurology that you put forth for me to be able to in any measure fact check what you're saying uh, at that level but it felt like reading your book really opened a whole different way of thinking about my experience of reality and the role that my neurochemistry and neurobiology plays in my perception of what is and isn't um, and my very understanding of how to engage what's real and what isn't quote real and so I think I just want to start off sort of complimenting and um, expressing my appreciation for the book because, yeah, it was an excellent read and seems to me thus far to be a very valuable one for myself. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So one of the central propositions you put in the book um, is this question about real and not real. And hmm. I've actually heard uh, Dennis McKenna speak something similar, which he called the primacy of experience. Um, hmm. I'm wondering if you can sort of start us off first with this idea that you put in the book, which is that all experience is real. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think what I don't do in the book is try and delineate, make that distinction between, you know, the sort of questions, obviously, I talk about DMT a lot, um, and have done for a number of years. And that's always the question, isn't it? You know, is it real, right? And <clears throat> I avoid that completely in this book, because I focus on what I know to be real. And that is the experienced world. Um, the I know right now, for example, that I'm having an experience. Um, and I have some idea of what that experience is built from uh, in my kind of worldview, my neurological, neuroscientific worldview. I know that <clears throat> my world is built uh, as a model of some kind. It's built by the brain. It's a complex pattern of information. Um, and all worlds that you experience um, are built from the same stuff, uh, whether they are, shall we say, mapped to some kind of external environment or not, whether they function as adaptive models of the environment or not, um, they are all made of the same stuff. So the world that you experience when you are dreaming, for example, right, that is as real in the way I'm defining the word real uh, as the world that you're experiencing during normal waking life, because they're made from exactly 
the same stuff. They're not just made from similar stuff. They're literally made from exactly the same stuff. Um, the difference, of course, is that when you are <clears throat> awake, we assume there's some kind of, there seems to be demonstrably some kind of mapping, some kind of relationship between this experienced world built from uh, as a model by the brain and the environment. So your brain is receiving information from the environment, sensory information, visual, auditory, etc. Um, and that modulates and informs uh, and helps to constrain this model. But the world that you experience is always uh, the model under all circumstances. And that applies in the DMT state as well, or any kind of psychedelic state. The world changes the world model changes, but it's not built from different stuff. Uh, it's always built from the same stuff, but its structure and its dynamics, they change. Um, so th the reason this is kind of important is because it allows you to step away from uh, questions about the external ontology of the DMT space, for example. You can simply focus on what's demonstrably true, which is that the brain is able to construct worlds. Uh, we know it can construct the so-called normal waking world. We know it can construct the very similar uh, dream world. Uh, and we also know it can, all, it can quite remarkably construct worlds altogether stranger worlds that bear no relationship to either of those such as the dmt state uh, which is another world built by the brain but is completely disjoint in a way uh, it has no relationship really normally particularly at high doses uh, to the normal waking world and the same with the salvia worlds if you take high dose of salvia you will be uh, experiencing an extremely strange world, uh, the, the structure and the dynamics of which is completely different to the, the normal waking world and in many ways the DMT world as well. But likewise, this is a world that's being constructed uh, by the brain. It's a separate question then. Um, are you interacting with <clears throat> living conscious entities? Um, that exists from their own side in the DMT space. That's a separate question. Um, so the book is really focusing on the brain as a world builder and how we can discover and explore these worlds, whatever their true ontology, whatever their true nature, whether they're mapped to an external environment, whether you really are visiting some other realm um, uh, or not. The world is still uh, built by the brain. Hmm. So, so a couple points of clarification. Mm. You know, you're saying that you know they're all it's all made from the same stuff, which is to say that the world. This isn't what you're not saying is that everything is a creation of the brain, or like consciousness is a byproduct of the brain, or life as we know it is a byproduct of of you know like neural activity and the resulting mental activity. What you're saying is that. Our experience of the world, our experience at all times, is something that is being, you know, made by the brains, the brain act through brain activity. Our experience, subjective experience of the world is made by brain activity. What you're not saying is what the brain is working with is a product of the brain, but that the results are always the product of the brain. And that there is such a thing as an external something that the brain can be working with in its world building process, which you're calling the environment. And our worlds can be more or less act, uh, functionally mapped to those environmental signals or completely detached from those environmental signals. And none of that is a question necessarily of whether or not that thing that we are experiencing is a freestanding um uh, a freestanding functioning something that exists outside of our mental process it's just an acknowledgement that it could be mapped on the environment it could be exclusively mapped internally and let's look at how the brain is building a world model so that we can just wonder about that process rather than wondering about 
how quote unquote, like now we're totally redefining the sense of what's real, but like what would previously be known as real, which is that like, oh yeah, because I can touch it, you know, this cup actually exists or this bottle or et cetera. Have I got that? Have I got that down? Yeah, you've got that absolutely spot on. Yes. Um, I think there's a couple of things. And it, firstly, when it comes to consciousness, um, what I, I I also avoid deliberately uh, is why is this pattern of information that we experience um, as the world? Why is why does that have this property of subjectivity, uh, i.e., you know, subjective consciousness? That's a very good question. <clears throat> What I'm really focusing on is, if you like, the the structure of subjective consciousness. Uh, you can think of the uh, in the book I describe it as the the pattern of information. Um, your experienced world is what this pattern of neural information feels like uh, from the subjective perspective. Why should it feel like something uh, to be? A pattern of neural information or to be a brain or whatever is, is a different question that's a deep uh, philosophical question and gets us into issues of um, <clears throat> you know whether we the conscious whether consciousness is uh, uh, emerging from neural activity in some way whether it's somehow fundamental uh, whether the brain is somehow in or a part of um, structured from consciousness these are very difficult and messy questions that uh, I have, you know, uh, opinions about, thoughts about, but I, I didn't want to get bogged down in these sort of questions. Uh, I wanted to focus purely on what we know, which is the kind of the structure of consciousness. We know that consciousness has structure, there are textures, there are, uh, you know, the qualities of consciousness, these qualia, right, the, the color red, the, the shapes and the textures and the sounds and this whole, <clears throat> um, whole unified, highly structured informationally rich thing that is your world um, that's what i fo focus on i don't try to think too much about why there's this subjective quality to it um so that's one kind of important point here uh, but the rest you've got absolutely spot on you know we know that the brain can construct these bizarre dmt worlds what we don't know is is this dmt world just like the normal waking world being mapped to some environment some other dimension some other reality some other universe some other plane of existence whatever that's another very interesting question uh, but one that i wanted to kind of <clears throat> avoid in the book and just focus on the worlds themselves so um yeah so we're talking about the sort of things that we do know, which is that certain patterns of experience or qualities of experience or like, yeah, have been mapped to different correlating brain function and all the way down to neural function and neural anatomy and sort of neural firing patterns chemically and otherwise. Uh, I guess it's all chemical or electrical, but, um, and so that's what you're focusing on. Now, what I found curious was this premise that you talk about and i believe um maybe his name is is it hoffman donald donald, donald hoffman. hoffman he presents this mm. idea that you know what we experience as reality external to us isn't necessarily the way things actually are it's just uh you know we have just evolved a capacity to experience whatever it is in a way that serves our survival management navigation through whatever that external world is. His, his uh, metaphor was, was when we move a file folder around on our computer and we open it up and we blah, blah, blah. We're not actually moving a file folder around. We are like influencing data, you know, binary code, well, it's probably more complicated binary code, but like it's actually just bits of data being moved around, but it's being represented to us as a folder in order to functionally manage it or functionally exactly. navigate it. And this is something that you're, you speak about too. And, and this goes into your mm. real versus, you know, the whole question of everything is real. Everything is really an experience. And so it's real in that sense, but not everything, not every experience is an adaptive model of the environment. 
Um, and in doing so, you kind of talk to the difference. Oh no, actually, I'll bring this up afterwards. Why don't you talk a little bit about this this you know adaptive model of the environment versus not an adaptive model of the environment, and how that goes into the th- the thesis that you put in the book. Um, yeah, so I mean, I've been reading Donald Hoffman for. Um, well, <clears throat> maybe 15 years. I mean, in his early papers, they were quite inspirational for me because he he nails it. I think in the book, what I'm doing is I'm he, he has what's called the interface theory, theory of perception, which you just described. The interface being, for example, the desktop on your computer. That's the interface. So my book is, if you like, is about the interface. It's not about the um, the hidden, the unseen um stuff that's going on in the external world so-called external world because we we don't have access to that so i'm i'm kind of looking at how the ways that this interface can be uh controlled and manipulated to make different interfaces but whether they actually interface um with <clears throat> the environment an environment in the dmt world for example whether that interfaces with an environment um, that exists outside of it beyond the brain um, you know, is a, is a completely different question. And what Hoffman was able to show and what he hypothesized, but he has a, quite a number of mathematical models now, simulations of kind of simulated worlds, if you like, um, in which you have these uh, what are called agents. So structures within the simulation that receive sensory information from the artificial environment and you you can actually find that there are many cases you can allow these agents to actually evolve and you can you can uh, he was actually able to prove that in many cases it's it's actually more adaptive the agent is more likely to survive and to reproduce if it doesn't have um, true information <clears throat> about the environment um, so your brain is not trying to uh, find the truth. That's the important point here. And in fact, this brain has no way of knowing what's true about the environment, really. Um, it has no direct access. What it can do uh, is it can build a model, uh, and then it can use this model to try and make predictions about the sensory information that it's receiving. Um, and depending on whether it gets the predictions right or not it kind of updates its model so it's basically it's all it's doing is kind of testing its model um this is called predictive coding or predictive processing which is one way of kind of a very probably the most prominent um uh, model of how perception works at the moment so your brain is it's never trying to kind of hone in on the correct or truest realist model of the environment because it has no way of doing that all it's trying to do is find a model um, that um, allows the the organism in in, in this case us to actually survive and to um, reproduce and pass on our genes to the next generation the brain doesn't have any concept has no yardstick by which to measure the truth it's not interested in fact in the truth of its model it's only interested in whether the model is adaptive is it functioning is it working uh, is it um you know when the model is running so to speak this world model um do the behaviors that result from this model you know things you see in the environment how you respond to them are they more or less likely um, to achieve a positive outcome right um with the positive outcome would be not dying uh, or the positive outcome might be you know <laughs> um finding you know reproducing right these are positive outcomes um which are essential that's all it's trying to measure uh, it doesn't care uh, about whether the model is uh, is true hmm. does that answer your question i'm not sure but i kind of it, it, it does it does and yeah. what it brings up is um You'd mentioned predictive coding. You'd mentioned sort of like uh, it's, it, the brain is sort of making predictions and it's sort mm. of checking it against errors. And this is something that I found to be very interesting. And it shifted because I was like, oh, this actually makes more sense than what I had before. You know, before I had this sense that, you know, all of experience is the brain sort of gathering 
information. I'll ask you about information afterwards, but it's gathering information. And then it's like putting those together based on the models it has to build up this perception of reality. But what I learned in in your book is that there is a, you know, there is a building up, which my assumption is as a child, I have no models. I just have a predisposed tendency to to towards a certain interp- uh, towards a certain engagement with reality based on how the brain has evolved in the human species to, you know, to build a particular uh, which uh, interfacing sort of system, which is then being guided by those above me, my parents, et cetera, to build a particular set of models from childhood. But then once into the perceptual system, I'm not building from the ground up. I am actually having these models and rep- representations already on board. And I'm kind of like throwing them out onto reality as like, okay, I think it's this, or I, I think, but mm. this is the hypothesis of what it is. And it's yeah. actually a top-down perception, which is being error-checked against bottom-up per- project perception. So I'm being like, no, it's going to be this unless I get enough information to tell me it's not that, and then I'll switch to a different hypothesis. But it's actually, although there is a building up, I assume, anyways, from childhood, infancy into, into adulthood, perception as a as a as a fully developed adult is actually from the from the top down precisely yeah i don't yeah i don't even need to be here you <laughs> <You're> <laughs> like i said i put a lot of time into your book andrew i thought it was fantastic <laughs> Clearly. yeah yeah no okay so first of all in terms of well yes so when you when you're born it's not quite true it's you you're certainly not born a blank slate and the the the, 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 the level to which the degree to which these models are inherited is is very much an interesting and very much an open question in in neuroscience and evolution you know how what part of these models are we born with the propensity to um, model a circle, for example, you might say, yeah, okay, um, but perhaps not. There might be some low-level propensity there to for geometric shapes, uh, you know, to, shapes oriented in space and that kind of thing, faces as well. Um, but then it's fine-tuned <clears throat> as you as you develop and, uh, and grow and mature, and by um, because these models, you just say, they're constantly being tested and crucially they're being updated so you have a model you know you you see some pattern of information in in the environment uh, and your brain is saying okay what can explain that pattern of information uh oh wait a second i've got this circle uh here that it looks like it could be a circle i'll try that yeah this is your hypothesis so it inserts effectively a, a circle model Uh, into your world model and then it checks to see if this circle model is working let maybe let's take a slightly more real world example Uh, if you can imagine a a ball uh, a snooker ball or pool ball in america Mm -hmm. um you don't play snooker do you um but a pool ball right rolling along a table now imagine it's rolling at a constant speed um how much information does the brain really need once it kind of says okay i think this is a you know we recognize this it's a sphere uh, it's it has a certain uh, velocity you know we can incorporate movement once the brain decides okay this is a pool ball moving along the table um you know it, it incorporates that into your world model and it will basically just continue testing that model uh, over time um, and it doesn't really need any more information then. That's the kind of the beauty of this. Once you have the model there, if the model is working, you don't really need any more sensory information. You know, the pool ball will conti- can keep moving. Your brain knows exactly what is going to happen next, um, as long as it doesn't do anything surprising. Um, so that's kind of what's, um, um, I guess, e- economical. Um, because processing sensory information is actually quite expensive you have to pa- you know, it has to pass through these networks of neurons which have to release neurotransmitters and information spreads and it's processed and that's not cheap um, so your brain doesn't want to you know uh, process sensory information it wants to keep it right down to a minimum and it does this using these models 
it, it creates you know, it has a, a set of, of models that it's learned and that some maybe, yes, you were born with certain models or at least propensities to certain to build certain models. Um, but then as you as you develop, these models are refined by uh, absorbing information um, from the environment. When you kind of mature, you have all these models there. They're ready to go. And just as you said, when you see a pattern of information in the environment, you would decide ah that's a cat right or something you know we've all particularly at night right if you when i remember when i was a teenager uh, my dad used to drive me home uh, you know, i've been at, kind of out with my friends on a saturday night and he would drive me home and often at the side of the road i would see people not real people i thought just for a brief moment the the road signs, perhaps the shadow from a tree, this pattern of information, sensory information, my brain, because maybe I <clears throat> consumed something earlier in the evening, I won't say, uh, but I was a teenager, normal teenager, kind of. Um, but I would see these people and I kind of enjoyed it. I would kind of focus my you know, stare blankly ahead and I would see people at the side of the road. So what's happening there? Well, my brain is seeing this pattern of sensory information in the dark uh, so it's not particularly reliable sense information uh, and it's it's thinking what is this what is this ah, it looks a bit like the sensory information i would expect from a human being and so it inserts a human being into my world model and for a brief moment there's a person there exactly in the same way there would be if there really was a person there yeah if you know what i mean <laughs> um so there's a, you know, I'm seeing the person in the same way um, as if they were really there. But then the brain continues testing as if there really is a person there. You know, as the car keeps moving, I should see, you know, the face move into profile, and you know, there's there's a lot of the brain has very good models of people, so it should know how that sensory information should evolve as I move. But of course, very very quickly, the sensory information. Um, the predictions from this model are unfulfilled and you get these errors and the brain suddenly checks, um, um, receives these error signals and says, okay, no, it's not a person. And then it, it, it readjusts and changes its hypothesis from person to, you know, street lamp and road signs and shadow from a tree. Um, so your brain is doing that all the time. It's finding the best hypotheses, um, you know, based upon what models it's got to try and explain this constant influx of sensory information. The idea being that it can minimize the actual amount of sensory information that it needs to absorb. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what yeah. that brings up is is one of the things that I, I got from reading the book, and I can't remember if you explicitly said this or if I just sort of like inferred it, which is something to the effect of you know, the brain has these hypotheses that are based on mm. its models. And it makes a hypothesis. And if everything goes according to plan, in the sense that, you know, it is like nothing happens that's strange. It's not like I look at the, oh, it's a ball rolling across the table. Oh, wait, actually, it's a swan. Whoop, mm. you know, like it's actually a swan on a lake. I mean, that's a pretty extreme difference. But as long mm. as it's like, okay, yeah, that hypothesis works, the brain's like, okay, cool, I'm good. So it's almost yep. like if it is what you, if it is, enough so what you the first hypothesis was about it then the brain doesn't put any energy into it like the brain puts energy into it when it turns out to not be what you, you know, think it was not be the hypothesis that it was um yeah and so you know what ran through my mind is like okay person okay person face person i know and the we're talking about oh is it a person is it a circle is it a ball rolling across the table you know visual perception auditory perception sure but the world building structure is you know it it's not just those things it's also the the whole rich and complex entire experience of of our realities including our sense of where we fit inside of space and time inside of relational networks the entire rich complex of meaning that we engage on various levels you know my brain is like okay i know that's a person i know that's a face i know that i recognize it so now all the energy for hypotheses and and sort of error predicting is going into sort of 
the social interaction, the 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 data I'm getting from facial expression and how that might infer emotion, you know, emotional reception of my words, or it's sort of going into a more conceptual end of things of just playing with the models in my mind in, in a con- conversation or et cetera. And just thinking about this sort of like, if the brain gets it right, there's really not very much energy or challenge. But if it gets it wrong, that sort of puts us in a place to actually start exploring really what might be going on here. Um, and the, just the, the, the rich complexity of all of this just goes so far beyond, is it a ball rolling across the table? It goes oh, yeah. into mm. our entire experience of being alive, s- having subjective experience of everything we've ever subjectively experienced to the full extent. Um, yeah, um, absolutely. And um, you know, the brain can also regulate, you know, which parts of the world it wants to particularly focus on. So you have something called change blindness, which is when you know, if I'm you know, I'm talking to you now, my brain is focused on you. So my brain is has this model of James Gesso, uh, and it's it's trying to predict the sensory information, and it will. It, you know, it will uh, it will pick up anything unpredictable every time you blink your eyes, for example, slightly irregularly. Um, my brain will notice that. But if something happens in my peripheral vision, um, um, something minor, the brain might not update its model because it's not really focused on um, the <clears throat> kind of um, focused on maintaining that model, maintaining its pr- uh, predictability in that part of the um, the world that I'm experiencing because it's not particularly important. So your brain has this ability, you know, we call it attention, of course, right? That's what it is. But really, what is, what is attention? It's when you've, you're focused on a particular aspect of your world, uh, and it could be the world outside or the world that you um, perceive as being outside, uh, or it could be uh, inside it could be the world inside your head. You could be thinking about some, um, you know, mathematical problem or whatever, and then you kind of turn your focus inwards, and then you might not um, notice. Uh, you know, your world model might not be updated. Um, mm, you know, so you might not see somebody walk into the room because you were particularly focused on a, a problem or something. You were, you were distracted, let's you say, and you were focused inward. Um, so, so it's 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 not just a matter of your brain having this huge unified model it's also your brain kind of choosing choosing and uh, distorting and um the model to try and make it work you know on a dynamic basis it's this incredibly rich and dynamic model uh, that your brain is constant it's 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 very actively um um, both constructing the model and testing the model and deciding which parts of the model to test, which parts are not so important. And so there's a lot of judgment going on there, right? You know, which which parts of the model do I need to attend to? Which parts can I safely ignore? Uh, what about the sensory information, which is another thing we'll probably get, get onto later. You know, how can I trust the sensory information even? You know, if there's some un- unpredictability, if something surprising happens, uh, that I that the model didn't predict is that because the model's wrong, or maybe the sensory information is somehow uh, unreliable. So what do I do then? Do I ch- update my model? Do I change my model? Is my model wrong, or do I have to just ignore the sensory information? So you've got all of these different processes going on at the same time, and of course we take it for granted. And it, all of this thing, you know, the brain isn't saying, of course, oh, is it? Is it a face? Is it someone I know? This thing is kind of, it's emerging. The world falls out in a way. The world falls out of this hierarchically ordered, immensely complex um, system that we call the brain. Um, The brain doesn't intend to build a model as such. It doesn't even intend to test its model. It's kind of the model falls out. It's just something that emerges from neural activity, which is also kind of interesting. So it's, um, yeah, we're scratching the surface of of what's going on here, I think. Um, uh, Yeah. So so as you responded to my initial comment, I I, Mm. comment just before, I realized there was something that I had meant to say but left out, which is, you know, once the brain decides that's it, 
it sort of like like you said, it sort of like cuts out anything else unless it's significant enough to have us question things. Well, when you're talking, I was thinking yeah. about those uh the experiment. I don't want to say what it is. I'll just encourage people to look into it. And if you know what it, listening, if you know what it is, you know mm-hmm. what I'm talking about. And if you don't look it up, which is the selective attention basketball uh video. Yep. Right. I won't I won't say anything yeah, more, but excellent. look it up if you can. Say anymore. Yeah. It's brilliant. And, the, yeah. and there's another one that's like a murder mystery. Um as well and and how much we can miss and now what's interesting there is that like you had said it's selecting from a bunch of stuff with a certain priority which is like is this is this adaptive enough of an interpretation to survive and serve whatever you know like uh, evolutionary goals or like i guess also our personal goals as individuals in a sort of technologically complex reality now but that means that it shuts everything else out. And now here's an interesting thing I was considering, which is that, well, then I'm not a, I, my experience is not a byproduct of brain. I uh, can be self-aware of my brain's processes and my subjective experience. And if I create a kind of, hypo- hi, I can create a kind of hypothesis that flips back onto the hypothesis itself. And I can start wondering about what I believe and what I'm experiencing. Mm. And by doing so, actively start testing the hypothesis of are my hypotheses real in a way that could create an opening to other sensory information or internally generated information. Um, yeah. So you're getting sort of meta hypotheses. And uh, I mean, what you're saying is, 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 is interesting because it, it brings to mind or to the forefront anyway of my mind um the most important model of all which is the self model right um we're not although the world is constructed by the brain we 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 experience the world from a position a point of view which we experience as the self the world isn't just a um kind of a single unified um structure in a way it, it there is this uh, whether it's a, a real or illusory there seems to be this boundary we have a way of separating the world um from the self there's like um, a constant relational dynamic it's exactly. never just objectively what it is. It's always objectively what it is in reference to it being other and self being self. And that dynamic exactly. exists. Well, at least baseline consciousness. That dynamic always exists. Even exactly. If we're not so that, meta aware of it. Exactly. Yeah. So so this is and this is of course is 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 important, you know, and, and the self is also a model. Um, but it's 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 one that seems to be reasonably coherent and maintained over time whenever you're awake. And of course, you can destroy that model, um, or you can cause it to disintegrate. If you take you know high dose of LSD or something, that self model um, can itself become um, start to break down. And then you do start to experience a kind of differentiated world where there's no separation between you and the world that you're experiencing. You kind of, um, it's described as, you know, ego death, of course, but also oceanic boundlessness, this loss of the boundary that we maintain um, between the self uh, and the outside world. Uh, because, of course, you know, the, the world outside or the our uh, the part of the world model that seems to be outside is of course it's it's in there as well um it's being constructed in the same brain as the model of the self is being constructed um so it it's it's, it's kind of a difficult process your brain has to learn how to separate maintain that as you describe it that relationship that dynamic relationship between self uh, and other and when you lose that um, it's quite, um, normally quite dramatic for people, you know, people who experience ego death, uh, uh after taking, you know, quite a high dose of, of LSD or something. Did it's you normally say tra- quite dramatic. Dra- dramatic, not traumatic, dramatic with a D. No, with a T. Oh, okay. I was <laughs> like, what? Traumatic. Both, both, both are What does dramatic possible? mean? 
dramatic, like a uh, like drama. Oh, dramatic. Like bait. Yes. I'm British. I would never say dramatic. <laughs> uh, it's, I'm North American. Pardon my accent. <laughs> Traumatic, yes. Yeah. Dramatic and traumatic, yes. It's both. Um, you know, it's psychologically dramatic and quite traumatic to lose that sense of self. So yeah, so you have you have the self model and you have um, the the other model, which includes everything else. And of course, you can um, distinguishing between them can sometimes be a problem. Um, so people who ex um, schizophrenics who suffer from uh, auditory hallucinations, for example, where they will hear voices. You know, everyone knows about hearing voices. You know, the voices of other people or aliens or something, telling them to do things. Um, now, what's going on there? You seem to have an an an, an another other. There's another self um, that you're experiencing. It does um, not appear so to be mapping to the environment as far as those of us existing in a consensusly mapped. A consensus map of the environment are perceived exactly, it, which makes us wonder: Is this, is that actually happening? Is that a map, or is that just an internally generated experience that doesn't have reference to the environment? Or maybe right. It does. Yes. Anyways, maybe it does, <laughs> but yeah, you you don't see. I mean, it's not like hallucinating a a person where you can you know you can see them and they can talk to you. That's just like in a sense, just like interacting with a so-called real person, when they're just in the head, this is very difficult. Uh, when you, you hear the voice purely in the head talking to you and there's no visual um, and, and, and other sen senses kind of forming the kind of the complete model, if you like, um, then you, you ascribe this voice to another, you know, some other being that somehow found its way into your brain into your consciousness um now there's the number of kind of theories and obviously psychiatrists and neuroscientists and psychologists have, have thought about this for for decades and the the kind of the prevailing wisdom of what's going on is that your everyone has internal monologues or most people you know you can not everybody Actually, not everybody. Not yes. everybody. I have recently no, learned. Most yeah. people can kind of talk to themselves silently. Um, and actually, when you talk to yourself silently, um, you know, you maybe you're rehearsing a, a lecture or whatever, right? You know, you're talking in your head. You're actually activating the same um, parts of the brain as when you're actually talking. Um, so um, normally that would also start to activate you know the auditory cortex as well because that's um obviously involved in in talking right and so there has to be some control there your brain has to point out if, you know, the frontal parts of your brain has to kind of maintain control and quieten the auditory cortex and basically say hey you know you're just talking to yourself i don't need this doesn't need to sound like a an actual voice and when when that when that when there's a disconnect there when different parts of the brain stop speaking to each other properly internally generated voices that you would normally know that were just you talking to yourself you lose that ability to make that distinction so voices start emerging in your head but you think ah i'm not deliberately making this voice so it's some other voice um so there's this sense of agency as well that we maintain and again that goes takes you to the idea of free will and how much of that we actually have which is another whole kind of question you did not approach in the in the book <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to get into well let's um, let's let's take a let's yeah. take a sh I, I know you're going a trajectory i am explicitly interrupting you um for good reason <laughs> I, I think it's good we'll see in hindsight bring me back um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I also want to comment, just make a quick comment of, you know, this theory that you just produced, the sort of commonly held understanding didn't include the potential that, that the person hearing voices isn't, isn't, or, or it didn't include the fact that they or the potential that they could be hearing something from external to them. And I'm not wanting to make a claim in one direction or another mm. but i also want to be really conscientious of something science material science physicalist science has has sort of historically done 
or you know, which is that like, oh, okay, anything that doesn't map onto consensus reality, as far as we've decided, qualifies is not real. And let's just give an explanation as to why it's not real, so that we could just like let whatever questions, you know, that introduces go away. And I just want to make sure that that question isn't entirely gone while not necessarily making a claim in one direction or another. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, it's, it's and it's the same kind of issue we have with, um, you know, DMT entities. There you go. I mean, yeah. you know, exactly the same, except you're normally dealing with more of a visual. Um, you know, are they just being constructed by the brain and given agency because we seem to not have control over them? We haven't deliberately produced them sure uh, like, a, like the agency recognition is another one of those higher order concepts that's that's exactly. significantly prioritized like seeing faces is significantly prioritized that's why we see faces oftentimes and things that don't have it exactly yeah so it's the same it's the same thing and and the question of course is you know is it mapped or is, it, is your brain receiving information from some other you know conscious entity and it's the same question with a, a, a so-called schizophrenic when they're hearing voices is it possible they're actually receiving somehow information that your brain is interpreting it, as it would auditory information uh, in ways that we don't yet understand and I will hold my hand up and say I don't know the answer to that question. Mm, great, great. Uh, all right, so <laughs> I'm going to try to make a move here. Um, okay, and we'll see how it works. Which is that you know we're about we're we're about halfway through, and I really want to get quite a bit of a discussion into you know like so far we're really just talking about the sort of uh, almost like the the found the foundation upon which the thesis of the book is offered. Which mm. is, you know, if anything, we're, we're, it seems like we're mostly talking about the first one and two chapters, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I want to get into some of the later content of the book, which has explicitly to do with psychedelics. Mm -hmm. But there's a number of things between where we are and that making sense that would be quite a long interview if we tried to go through each one. So I am going to attempt to summarize these Good. things and then you okay. can clarify what I got wrong or compliment, okay. uh, like a compliment upon. Compliment you. All right. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, so we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, we've talked about information. The brain, you know, like works with information. You explicitly talk about information being something that is generated out of a larger sort of, we'll say, pool of potential data information is generated by the selection of some data over others. The selection of that data becomes the information out of the things that we did not select. I interpreted this like finding signal in noise, we've made that signal by, by selecting it out of potential noise, meaning that there's a lot of other potential information that we did not select. And we select it based on certain variables, the model, the evolved brain function to happen in a certain way, etc. The brain then renders that information into experience. What it renders into is sort of is, is a world. And so in a sense, you describe, I think you describe the brain as a world building machine, right? So it, it builds, it builds a world for us to experience based on some combination of evolutionary trajectory and sort of we'll say social sociocultural trajectory the brain has a tendency in its baseline operation to produce a sort of kind of space um, a kind of uh, subset of potential world that we all for the most part experience the same which is consensus reality but that consensus reality isn't necessarily the only world that we can experience. And out of the possible selection of information, out of the possible hypotheses, out of the possible configuration of brain state activation, there's a lot of potential worlds that we could experience, which you refer to as the world space. And that baseline reality is a certain subset of potential states that we could that we might get into that we experience as consensus reality. There's a particular world space that we can access. And that we access that one over another 
is because of these factors, brain, uh, sort of evolutionary brain uh, trajectory, sociocultural values, et cetera, that makes certain hypotheses, certain models stronger than others, which is correlated with the brain being more likely to fire. It's sculpted in priority to these to these um, particular hypotheses as being not only prioritized, but easier, more energy efficient to access were the ones that are not prioritized or less energy efficient. So it all just sort of shapes economically and otherwise towards prioritizing certain hypotheses, certain subset of the world space. Your suggestion is that psychedelics are like tools to switch and fine tune what subset of world space is available, what subset of worlds are available to experience by altering the functioning of the brain, by altering which hypotheses are prioritized or deprioritized, accessible and inaccessible, and that different sort of neurological classes of psychedelics have different, distinctively different effects and distinctively take us into different potential world spaces. And each class is its is a kind of switch into a different world space. And each and you have a number of different switches that are available. Um, C switch, M switch, N switch, K switch, etc. And from here, I want to go into these different switches. Is there mm-hmm. anything that I missed or got wrong there or that you'd like to follow up on in order for us mm-hmm. to move into that section of the conversation? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, so so first of all, so let me take it back. So so basically, every every moment of your existence, if you like, when you were awake or whatever, uh, when you're experiencing a world, every moment is, if you like, a world. It's a single pattern of cortical activity, what I call a single state of the cortex. And I describe in the book how what these states are, they're patterns of activation of these very tiny areas of the brain called cortical columns. So every moment your brain is in one of these states and your experience of a world is as it moves through these states. You know, every every moment is different from every other moment. Uh, and this is possible because there's a vast number of possible states, a vast number of possible patterns of neural activity. And each one, each pattern is a world moment, if you like. So if you think of all possible states, all possible uh, patterns of activation, um, it's a vast state space. But that entire state space represents every possible world moment that could be experienced by the brain. That is the world space. So there aren't different world spaces. There's only one world space, but it's a vast landscape. I describe it as this world space landscape. So what the brain is doing, as you kind of described there, I'll put it in a slightly different way, is it molds its connectivity, the patterns of connections between uh, all these different areas of the brain so that it naturally moves towards the states that represent the adaptive model of the environment. Uh, so th- so the, the, this vast number of states that represents the normal waking world is actually a small district, a small area of the world space. And when you take certain psychedelics, you're entering different regions of the world space um, that represent worlds that, that have no relationship, that are completely different to uh, the normal waking world. So that's what you're doing you know, with the, uh, the C-switch, like the classic switch, you're moving to, you can shift to you know, the, the worlds, the, the DMT world, for example, with DMT, with salvia, you can move to different areas of the world space. So psychedelics allow you to reach areas of the world space that you you wouldn't normally reach because the brain is has it's within this kind of attractor basin if you like uh, where it only can access these what are often described as low energy state these attractor states and what psychedelics are doing broadly first of all is kind of flattening this attractor landscape allowing the brain to reach other areas of the world space and we'll probably get to it later but with certain drugs you can actually cause this attract a landscape, this vast world space landscape to kind of uh, 
collapse into an entirely new geometry where completely different regions become attractors and the cortex then tends to um, move to those states. And that's what happens when you break through on DMT, for example. Um, I think that, yeah, that's pretty much where you were. Great, great. Um, mm. Now, maybe this this will go into the discussion about the C-switch, which is where mm. our hypotheses and the stability and strength of our hypotheses, how that's affected by the flattening of the world space landscape and psychedelics, mm. various psychedelics um, impact on neural function in order to flatten that landscape. So unless you want to comment on that now, mm. I'd love to get into the C switch. Mm, sure. Yeah. So Let's tell me it. a little bit, first off, what is the C switch and what class of drugs um, does it encompass before I ask you about what it is that it's doing to the brain and its impact on our hypotheses and perception of environment. Yeah, so the C in C switch is classic. So it's with the C switch is it's not like a, a light switch or something. This the, the, the switch is this multi multi level mechanism in the brain that we all have. It's a, it's an intrinsic part of our neural architecture. It consists of these receptors in certain classes of populations of neurons in the cortex that the classic psychedelics like LSD, psilocybin, DMT, 5-MeO, etc., mescaline, uh, this class of serotonin receptors that these molecules bind to. It, it's also this particular um, perturbation of the intracellular signaling pathways within these neurons which changes their activity changes their behavior changes the way that they fire changes the way that they communicate the way they share information with each other um, so it's that whole level that whole you know the, the receptor level the neuron level the cell level and then the network level that whole mechanism i together i call that uh, the c switch i you know the unified mechanism of um, how these classic psychedelics affect the structure and dynamics of your world. And so before you go into that, I want to just mm. clarify for the listener what you just what you just sort of like generally sort of touched on and generalize is a big bulk of the book, like going very specifically into these pathways, these connectivities, the mm. you know different like the neuronal function down to the you know the chemical and neurotransmitter level. So for the listener, if they're like, if you're like, wow, it feels like there's so much more that I'm not getting here, it's true, and mm. your book contains yeah. all of that. So yeah. I just wanted I just wanted that there for the listener, mm. and then and then yeah, please continue. Yeah. Um, so so there's there's a number of ways you can talk about the six uh, the, the, these switches in particular the c switch you can think of it in terms of how is it affecting the the model you know we had this idea of the model using it the model to make predictions about sensory information testing it and then receiving error signals and updating the model this cycle of model testing that's one way of thinking about it a slightly kind of different perspective is to think about uh, the world space landscape and how that is structured. How does it affect the geometry of this world space landscape? Which states, uh, which areas of the landscape are attractors and, and, and which are kind of more high energy forbidden states? Um, so, yeah, I think from the, the model perspective, basically what's happening again at quite a high level, there's a lot more detail in the book as you, you are well aware. Um, the when these classic psychedelics when they bind to uh, these population of information generating cells these neurons in certain layers of the cortex um, they stimulate they activate these neurons and they cause them to fire more easily and more frequently and they cause information to start to spread um, between these neurons, between these cortical columns, these areas of the cortex. So the model that your brain has honed and fine-tuned with its connectivity over evolutionary epochs, over you know your development and experience, that model starts to be disrupted. It starts to be loosened. It's like you're you're disrupting all these 
very carefully and finely tuned patterns of connections that maintain the structure of the model and cause it to break down, right? So there we can see straight away uh, what kind of happens with a low dose of a psychedelic. Uh, the world starts to change. It starts to seem more fluid and dynamic. The identity of objects seems to kind of change. You know, you might see walls breathing. Everything seems a bit more labile and fluid and unpredictable. And it seems unpredictable because it is, right? The model is is no longer as rigid and well-defined. And so the brain starts to fail in making these predictions. It can no longer make good predictions about um, the sense of information. Um, now, this has an important consequence because the only information that actually makes it up into your cortex, as we discussed earlier, is actually these error signals, right? You know, when it makes, when the brain makes a mistake, it fails to, its predictions are not fulfilled, then that information flows up. That's the sensory information is in the form of error signals. So when the model starts failing, the world starts becoming more fluid, these error signals start to increase dramatically, right? So in a way, that's a all I'm saying here is what, in, in, a, in a kind of a much more modern neuroscientific parlance is exactly what people like Huxley were saying 50 years ago whatever that the brain is you know uh, has a, a filter a reducing, a reducing valve, valve. right yeah. right yeah and and that the LSD or mescaline removes that filter so you know that was a great idea and it's kind of true but how does that work now we kind of start to understand what the filter is the filter is about predicting and basically extinguishing all sensory information that your brain can predict because it doesn't need to know about it. And then when it when it fails, it's those errors that are making it through. So it, only this a trickle of these error signals normally because the model is working well. When the model breaks down, you get an influx of error signals. That's equivalent to basically destroying the filter. So the world becomes more dynamic, it becomes more fluid but also becomes very sensitive to sensory information. So everything, you know, the identity of objects starts shifting before the eyes because your brain, of course, uses normally, um, uses these error signals to update its model. You know, if there's increase in error signals, the brain says this, this hypothesis about what this sensory information means must be wrong. And that's happening more and more when you're in the psychedelic state. And so this is why you get the, you know, particularly with higher doses of psychedelics. And we're Object specifically still talking about C classical psychedelics. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Continue. Yeah. 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 So, so as these error signals start increasing, your brain is constantly updating its model to try and stop these error signals. It's trying to find a hypothesis that explains the sensory information, but it can't. Right. So this is why you can start to you can literally see objects that will actually change their identity in front of your eyes and then change back again. Um, now, now uh, let me let me jump in mm. here because again, mm. we're looking at this at a very sort of simplified way. Well, it doesn't seem simplified, but it is very simplified because now you're talking about objects. But as the sort of mm. normal st sort of strength of the hypotheses is destabilized and, and no particular hypotheses can take a strong hold. And instead, we're getting way more sensory information as the error signals rise up and the brain is like, wait, I got to deal with this now and this and this and this. Hmm. It's not just objects. It's how we perceive situations, how we, what, how and what we're feeling, you know, and how much of what's happening is beyond our ability to have a hypothesis. So it's like, hmm. In my mind, I'm thinking about why it is that in psychedelics, we can get entirely different understanding of, you know, that thing that we did that now we realize was wrong and we feel grief for, or actually that that person maybe wasn't as awful to us and we're giving them a hard time or like, oh, actually the tree is a living, breathing thing that I can touch and feel. And like, you know, there's all these different levels that's more than just like, oh, I can't tell if it's like if the glass is half empty or half full, man. You know, right. it's like, it's it's much more rich and complex on a very level of not only just meaning, and I assume you'll eventually get to it, but how the model by which we understand ourselves in relationship to the model that is the world outside of us, or quote, world outside of us.
Mm, precisely, yeah. So it's not simply about identifying and placing objects in the world. If you look at, there are relationships, of course, not only between the objects, but also uh, between how you respond to them and your relationship. How how is that? What is the relationship between the self uh, and the object? You know, what are your opinions? What are your thoughts? What is your working understanding of the situation as you described there? And how do you feel about it? You know, and, or the individual. Well, you know, you might be talking to a, another person who is again part of this world model. What is the relationship there? How do you feel about them? You might have very um, rigid opinions about this person, positive or negative. When, once that all starts to break down, the, you know, it's not just the structure of the object, the structure of um, these hypotheses, but also all of their relationships. So all that starts to break down. Uh, and so this is why things, you know, you can become more creative um as long as things don't become too wild you know taking 300 micrograms of lsd and trying to be creative is probably not a good idea but certainly with lower doses you're loosening things up generally uh, are you right you know I, I focus on the things that are easily to kind of visualize you know which is the structures of objects in the environment of course, yeah. but of course but actually as you quite rightly pointed out it, these deep you know, it's not just about the objects. In fact, it's more about the way that the relationships between the objects um, that's important. Um, and and all the time, your brain is making judgments about you know, these kind of relationships. And there's a jostling, there's competition between different hypotheses all the time. It's not just, ah, I think this is the hypothesis. Your brain might explore several hypotheses, several ways of interpreting sensory information or several ways of um, interpreting the relationship between yourself and that sense of information. And normally that happens very quickly and something wins out and everything seems stable and obvious. But when, or when all that starts to break down, uh, it's, you know, it, it's not just the world, the visual world that's changing, but your whole, um, existence really, uh, sure. starts to, uh, uh, starts to change. Right. And, and, and you get to a sufficient dose and they're the the hypotheses that is i am a i am a self experiencing goes away and as far as say like that exp since so much of our sense of being alive is being a self being a particular me it's as though that me dies and we come to we have a different experience and then as it starts to return we have the sense that it was gone it died so at a sufficient of dose we have you know, I think ego death, I'm starting to have a bit of an edge against the term, you know, but we have this ego death experience. Yeah, precisely. So, you know, you've, you've, you've always got, um, you know, it's quite a difficult job, as I was saying earlier, to, to maintain that relationship. And your brain has to constantly maintain that relationship between the self uh, and the environment and the experienced world, you know, which is all part of the same model. Uh, and that there has to be some kind of coherence there over time in order for your brain to maintain that perspective if you like you know the the the, the self model has to remain intact but also its relationship can't change uh, between you know the different objects in the environment once you know, you've got two things going on you've got the self model itself starts to break down um and then you've got the the distinction between the self model uh, and the so-called outside world model also starts to break down so you get this blurring the you, yourself starts to dissolve so this is the ego dissolution if you like uh, and that's accompanied by the loss of distinction between the self and the environment which is oceanic boundlessness so all of this we can start to explain using this um framework that i use in the book Sure, which which specifically what we're explaining is the relationship, the correlation between brain activity and subjective experience. We're not explaining the meaning of those experiences, or you're not cosmologically, philosophically, spiritually, only just the correlations between brain function, perturbation of brain function through, you know, chem chemical introduction of pharmacological agents and subjective experience. Precisely. Um, yeah. Now, this is something that I'm I had the idea of while reading the book, and I'll bring it to you now, specifically with these classical psychedelics, which seems like what you're saying is it actually increases the amount of signal we're getting from our environment 
while destabilizing our ability by destabilizing our ability to land strongly on a particular hypothesis that would enable us to you know eliminate the rest of that information from getting up into the brain now as i was reading this of course what was running through my head was wonder and the subjective experience like trying to map my subjective experience of being on psychedelics to your model here and being like oh that would explain why if i'm always in this this state of like wonder and wow you know could possibly could be overwhelmed depending on how i'm i'm exper- like where my dispositions are it's like that would make sense because the brain is going what what's happening like and i'm experiencing as wow everything is so much more i can't I don't have a strong hypothesis that fits. And so I feel like I'm, you know, I'm I'm at the whim of something that is of great mystery because I can't solve it. And mm. so I was thinking about wonder in relationship to this destabilization of uh of of hypotheses and increasing of error signals. And the other thing I thought of was insights and me and the meaning of insights. And I just put this together now, which is that. If the brain is like, God damn, I really need a hypothesis right now. Like this, I need one. And but instead it's just being confronted with all this different information that otherwise it wouldn't be confronted with, as the, you know, the molecules do their thing pharmacologically. At some point, it's gonna land on something as it's starting yeah. to make its way back. And after I've spent a quite a bit of time just like completely in oh trying to make sense of something as soon as it lands on something it landing on something would seem really profound mm. so it's like the profound insights is me landing on a new hypothesis that's stable and in a context of completely un- a whole landscape of unstable hypotheses this would really be like super important that i got this mm. and it would also make sense as to why afterwards when i'm back in my predictable sort of normal, norm, predictable, normal reality mm. that I would struggle with understanding why this insight was so meaningful because the state of consciousness that I'm in now, the neurological baseline, and this is actually part of the book that I was writing and maybe will write again, which I've already started taking notes as to where your work will get woven in, is is that there needs to be a translation from that state of consciousness where that thing was meaningful into baseline if it's ever actually going to land in our lives afterwards. Um, mm. So yeah, I was just thinking about wonder and why these insights are so powerful when we do find them. I'm thinking specifically on psilocybin, but also on things like LSD and, and the other classical psychedelics. You got any thoughts or responses to that? Well, I mean, all I can say is that, I mean, you know, we can ask questions about why why might the brain, given the opportunity, uh, land on certain um, land on certain hypotheses? Why would it? Um, so, perhaps a way to think about it is that you're there are these. Um, maybe that's quite tricky, but if you imagine there's more than one attractor. Um, and that this one is actually very significant, this basin, if you like, of, of, of attraction, but you, you never get to access it. It represents something quite important, some aspect of the model, but your ne- brain never kind of accesses it um, because it's stuck in this you know, um, way of modeling reality that it's done you know, throughout your life. And when you just flatten the landscape, slightly you allow the brain to explore a bit more sometimes you know you're not completely flattening the the, the landscape that would be the case where every state was equally likely and that the brain would just wander randomly you wouldn't go anywhere Maybe so it's like not flattening dmt we're no, perfectly right, okay, flat and everything we'll is everything later, i guess but <laughs> you know it's not completely flattening but it's allowing it's just it's just raising and and flattening this lands attractive landscape out and allowing the brain to explore. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's just going to wander. It might actually find another attractor. It allows it to kind of it reduces the energetic barrier, if you like, and allows it to fall into something else that you that has some significance, some meaning. Um, it might be something to do with your your past. It might be trauma, right? It could be a traumatic memory, um, some model 
way of modeling reality that you um, don't want to deal with, right? You don't want to experience, you know, that's perhaps this could be one way of thinking about, um, you know, repressed traumatic experiences is that they exist, you know, they're, they're obviously they can be modeled by your brain because you experience them, but your brain has kind of pushed them away. They, they occupy this kind of higher level. Um, so your brain never really re- goes to those states again, but in under the psychedelic state, they can actually reach these states and they you know, sit within this local attractor um, uh, and, and remain there for some time. So I, I don't think it's, um, we should, um, for any reason, think that it's you know the, the, when you take a psychedelic, it's all just going to be random stuff. I don't say that at all, um, but that you know that's kind of the the feeling at first. Certainly, um, is that it, it becomes more random, more fluid, more dynamic. But certainly, you know, the brain can find itself in these little local attractors, which is might be kind of partly, not entirely, what you're describing. I think you're describing several things, and it's quite a rich tapestry of ideas that you've woven there um, but but you know you know the, the, this is the kind of ideas that's nice to explore is 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 you know, and different perspectives and we can look at this whole process of world building and the world space landscape from all these different perspectives and and get insights into <clears throat> um you know why the psychedelic state is as it is uh, but also how we might utilize and again this is probably something we'll talk about later how we might actually utilize the world's space landscape how we might actually uh, in some way engineer the, the structure and the geometry so we can actually distort the landscape so that we can find we can make certain areas attractors and we can do that with dmt of course um, we discovered that that if you perturb this brain the brain with dmt it it, it goes beyond the flattening that you get low doses of the classic psychedelics and you get this collapse into an entirely different geometry where a completely different region of the world space landscape becomes an attractor um so yeah lots going on okay so so maybe i do want to give us some space to get into that but we have a number of different switches and before we switch switch over to a different Mm -hmm. switch um something to clarify okay so we're so far we've been talking about the c switch which is the classical psychedelics the classical psychedelics all sort of fit the general category of primarily having their uh their psychedelic effects being primarily associated with a very particular subset receptor subset which you didn't say 5-hd2a receptors but includes lsd dmt psilocybin all the mescaline like phenethylamine compounds which i do believe also involves like uh was it like dom and and those but like this whole classical psychedelic Mm -hmm. uh world this particular subset receptor so everyone we've talked about with respect to the destabilizing of hypotheses and so on and so forth has been with respect to the c-switch thus far um now before we move into the m switch the tropane alkaloids Mm. you said something about Oh, we'll talk about that 5-MeO DMT thing later. And you've talked a number of times of your sense of, you know, DMT having this effect that sort of collapses the world space into a very particular structure. What are your mm. thoughts on that versus 5-MeO DMT, which is a radically different experience, although also a complete switch, but working in the same, generally the same receptor subtypes? Yeah. So, I mean, again, it's 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 like different you know, different strong perturbations of this world building system will cause the the landscape to adopt different geometries um and we see this with other complex systems as well in the book i describe a, a um uh, a society of ants where you know the, the ant whole society is has these emergent behaviors um that it can switch between so it's not switching just between states, it's switching between entirely different behaviors, such as defend against an intruder. That's a whole pattern of behavior. It's a whole set of states, if you like, within the attractor landscape of the ant society. Uh, and that's a different behavior from building a bridge over water, which certain 
ant species can do. Um, so other complex systems, you know, and the ants will do it by perturbing their own um, complex system by changing the way the interactions between themselves, you know, the chemical signals, etc., and visual signals, they will change those interactions and they will cause the attractor landscape to to to, to, um, to collapse into a different geometry where the build a bridge over water states become attractors and then they switch back to perhaps the normal housekeeping state, right? Um, so so there's there's more than one way, in other words, to change the geometry of the space, um, of the world space attract a landscape and so with with 5meo broadly without trying to kind of explain or explain away the actual nature of the experience i can say at a very high level uh, that you are distorting you are causing the world's space landscape to to collapse into a very particular uh, geometry again that's different to its um, standard geometry as in the normal waking state and also different to the dmt state now we can speculate on what kind of change is that is it a um a complete flattening i would suggest probably not because that that would be more of a uh, just a random walk across the world space landscape or is there some way that we could describe how that that geometry works i don't think we understand the um the structure and the geometry of this this world of this huge state space of the brain yet we're not even close to that um, the model you know at the moment this is a very kind of um well, not back of the envelope model but it's a very it's very much a working model. There's certainly a lot we need to learn. Um, but I think with with five meo, certainly it's not um, it's not inexplicable why five meo is very different to DMT. Um, but we don't quite understand why that particular perturbation with five meo, uh, with that you know slightly different molecule with just an extra methoxy group on the indole ring, um, causes such a dramatically different experience uh, but we know it must be because it's 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 distorting it's causing a completely different geometry uh, of, of this world space landscape hmm. okay let's let's mm. turn towards the m switch okay so we're running mm. uh you know we're not running low on time but i do want to give some space for this discussion about you know what can we do with this um mm -hmm. and so you know the granularity of the c-switch maybe not to the significant extent um for these mm. other ones although i am very curious i had a lot of ideas about the k the the n switch but that's an aside um so the the m switch this is about the tropane alkaloids these are the chemicals mm. that are present in things like um um datura plants uh what's the other ones Berg, bergmansia um, I don't know. I don't know what the other ones are called. Madre, uh, yes, that's henbane, the old yeah. world kind of witching herbs. Yeah, yeah. So why don't you give us a sense of just quickly, you know, what is it doing to the brain um, mm. in the that creates this experience that is an entirely different switch. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So again, you know, it's, it's a different switch because it's a different me molecular neuronal and network uh, mechanism which is why i keep it separate it's called an m switch because um the these tropone alkaloids they bind to a receptor not the 5-HT2A receptor like the classic psychedelics but to an acetylcholine receptor called the m1 receptor and they're actually antagonists so they block the receptor they prevent acetylcholine binding so that's kind of the low level you know but why would that cause these bizarre delirium psychedelic effects of the tropanes um so yeah keeping it fairly brief um so so all the time as you were saying your this world model is 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 kind of being held accountable it's being moored to sensory information in some way right it's, it's always has to test its model against sensory information against the environment and it's the area yes sensory information presumably from the environment right again we don't know anything about the environment but sure, sure. all the brain is is receiving the sensory information yep so it's testing the sensory information trying to explain it and it's the error signals that are being processed by the brain when it 
when it, it, the, the predictions aren't fulfilled, when the model is sort of seems to be breaking down. Now, as I was saying earlier and kind of leading to this, your brain has to kind of always strike a balance between trusting the model and trusting the sensory information. So if the sensory information isn't predicted correctly, there's two interpretations here. Either the sensory information is correct, yeah, which means the model is wrong. So you need to update your model until the sense until the error signals go down. Yeah. Or, and this is important, the sensory information is wrong. Yeah, it's unreliable because sensory, uh, in which case you ignore the error signals and say, actually, I trust my model more. Um, so I'm going to ignore that sensory information, even though something happened there. I was unable to predict it. Maybe the sensory information is just noisy. Yeah, it may, if it's dark, for example, you know, your brain can't really trust sensory information as much. Or if you're talking to a friend over a long distance, crackly phone line, uh, your brain kind of fills in words and stuff uh, to try and make sense uh, and doesn't trust that every is actually, you know, newsworthy changes in sensory information. So there's a striking the balance uh, and your brain will, depending on how much your brain trusts the sensory information, it can change the volume of these error signals. It can turn the volume up if it thinks the sensory information is reliable or it can turn the volume down if it thinks the information is unreliable, in which case it kind of becomes slightly detached from the environment because it's no longer being held accountable to sensory information because the error signals are muted. Um, now, the volume switch in the brain, or one of the volume switches, is um, this M1 acetylcholine receptor. So these turn the volume up. So if your brain really trusts the sensory information, it releases acetylcholine into uh, the cortex and it binds to these M1 receptors and activates neurons that are carrying this error, these error signals, right? Um, and then when it wants to turn the volume down, it, it pulls back the acetylcholine release. So what the tropanes are doing, they're binding, they're blocking these M1 receptors. Uh, they're preventing acetylcholine binding, even when the sensory information is perfectly valid. So it's kind of mimicking a state where the brain doesn't trust sensory information at all. Uh, and so the model is no longer held accountable to sensory information. It becomes divorced, rather like a dream. Um, it, it, um, it becomes completely unmoored, if you like, from the environment. Uh, and so it can start to drift, first of all. Um, things can be incorporated in the model that are not corrected. So I was speaking earlier about you know, driving down the road and seeing people on the side of the road. But instantly, within you know maybe a couple of seconds, my brain corrected the model. Yeah, it picked up the error signals, corrected the model. It's not a person. It's just a road sign, trees or whatever. That doesn't happen in the tropane state. You have an, an impression of a person. You see the person. That the person is incorporated into your world model, but it's never corrected. And so people, you start to see people, uh, and they can re this kind of false model, if you like, or non-adaptive model, can remain perfectly stable for very long periods of time with quite dramatic consequences. So in the tropane state, people will describe, you know, having parties in their dorm room or something. You know, the story, if you go on Erowit, you'll read these horrifying accounts or, uh, or quite funny accounts, depending on your perspective, you know, of people taking tropanes, smoking tropanes or whatever, ingesting somehow, and then, um, you going into their their room and and seeing everyone having having a party and everyone's naked and they were talking about swiss cheese for for three hours and and then they have a sudden moment of kind of focused attention and they realize that none of this happened um so it, it's quite different to the classic psychedelics in the classic psychedelics you're getting more sensory information you're getting more error signals you're more connected to the environment with the tropanes, the model becomes divorced, unmoored from, disconnected uh, from the environment. And so you enter a kind of a waking dream uh, world. Now, these world models can become just as um, bizarre and strange, um, but, but for different reasons 
because the brain is no longer being held accountable. It's no longer being tested and modulated and constrained by sensory information. Um, so it's like being in a, a very strange waking dream, um, but where you actually have still control of your body. So people get into quite dangerous situations on tropanes uh, because they're convinced everything seems so real. You know, tropanes produce what are called true hallucinations, the title of the classic Terence McKenna book, of course, right? True hallucinations are ones that are, they don't announce themselves as being hallucinations or as being visions. You know, the classic psychedelics, they tend to do, right? Uh, you tend to have insight. This is a hallucination, but the the, the detura or the mandrake or whatever the tropane hallucinations they 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 never announce themselves they're never corrected you never know uh, that you're uh, experiencing a hallucination um which is why they can be they're often described as delirians the person will appear to be you know insane basically mm. um talking to people for long periods of time they're smoking phantom cigarettes uh, they're acting as if they're in a different world and in a way they are they're experiencing a world that is not properly mapped um to the environment mm. yeah what it, it it makes me think of um well just how in dreams you said like dreams dreams are kind of doing this totally divorced mm. from the external world you're in this other reality which is entirely constructed of your mind um but the difference between dreams and say you know datura is that the brain has made it so that I can't move when I'm dreaming. Mm. Where on, exactly. you know, Datura, I could be walking around doing things and, yes. you know, not like, or I could be, yeah, I, I, I could not be walking around doing things, but think that I'm on a trek in the jungle. But like, I could be walking around doing things and acting this kind of stuff out, which are going to be quite dangerous. Um, yeah. Now, when you brought up the acetylcholine, I don't want to go into this too much, but you're like, oh yeah, so the brain can, you know, allow more activation and say to bring in more error signals, more of the sensory mm. environment. And it actually made me think about learning and the role acetylcholine plays in learning a thing. It's totally vital, right? It's like acetylcholine is like, yeah, this is important. Focus on this because we don't know what this is. We need to get as many error signals up as possible to like form us a, a reasonable hypothesis and yeah, the role, the role acetylcholine plays in learning and then thinking about the opposite of that, like absolute shutdown, none of this signal means anything, but the brain is still building a world based on, yep. you know, whatever models are, are sort of like going to operate. I imagine there must be some influence, but then again, maybe not. Oh, of the course, environment, yes. but, yeah. It's not like you're completely, you know, you're not completely switching off error signals but you're you're turning them down so much that it's very difficult you have to have focused attention you know, this is why what will happen is you will you will drift the, the world will drift right into strange places then suddenly you're back again you kind of you have a moment of focused attention your frontal cortex kind of you know there's lots of mechanisms a number of mechanisms for attention and controlling error signal not just acetylcholine so you know the world will drift you'll be in an airport walking around you know getting you know trying to get your flight of course none of this is really happening uh, and then suddenly you'll get a moment of focused attention and you'll be back and go okay what was just happening there you know, everything is everything is okay again and then it isn't again right and and you 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 have you can com you completely lose any any grip that you had or you thought you had on reality you don't know what's real you don't know if this is a moment of lucidity or is this just another um you can imagine how kind of horror kind of frightening that must be you know you, you're, you're moving through these different states you know you, you know you, you're snapping back but you don't know whether you snap back to what the world should be like so to speak a kind of a sober focused state where you're properly modeling the environment or whether you've just you know, shifted to another another kind of part of the waking dream, if you like. So it can be very disorienting, very, um, you know, delirium, you know, for most people is how it would be described. It's certainly not recommended, mm. um, this kind of thing. Okay, so that was the, the M <laughs> switch. Um, yes. Because, and again, it's because it's specifically affecting this particular site on the acetylcholine receptor, which was, what was it called? The M switch? 
M1 acetylcholine yeah. receptor. Yeah, it's actually a yeah. muscarinic receptor. There you go. Yeah, um, that's just resonate down. So I don't forget it. All right, so let's get into the N switch, which is mm. PCP ketamine. Yes, so N is for NMDA, yeah, uh, which is a, another type of receptor. So this is a um, a glutamate receptor in the brain. It's uh, it's also an excitatory receptor, which means it stimulates neurons. Um, and what ketamine and PCP um, and other um, similar kind of drugs. Um, uh, they do is they they bind and they they block these uh, NMDA receptors. So whereas tropanes they block the M1 receptor, the ketamine and related drugs they block this NMDA uh, receptor. So that's the game, the low the lowest level. What's going on now? What's interesting is that the you know, the end switch is a bit more complicated because it has you have these plateaus of effects at low doses. You actually get um, kind of psychedelic like effects, right? You get an increase in neural activity, just like you do with the classic psychedelics. Uh, and this is because um, these NMDA receptors are found on the main excitatory neurons that are building your world model, um, the ones that are speaking to each other and sharing information, but also these this population, this very dense population of neurons called inhibitory interneurons. And their role is to inhibit, to suppress the activity of these and control and regulate the activity of these main uh, excitatory neurons. They're always working uh, to, to regulate your neural activity. And these ketamine tends to preferentially, for reasons that we probably shouldn't get into a little bit complicated preferentially at low doses anyway tends to bind to the nmda receptors on these inhibitory interneurons so it's inhibiting it's blocking um, the activity of the inhibitory interneurons yeah so it's releasing the excitatory neurons from their control it's called disinhibition uh, so it's like two two negatives equals plus yeah um, so you're inhibiting the inhibitory interneurons, which, which causes an increase in neural activity. Uh, and this has a similar effect at low doses as the classic psychedelics. It's allowing these world building neurons, if you like, to, um, to share information for information to flow more easily. And again, we get disruption of the world model in a kind of, not exactly the same way, but in a kind of analogous kind of way. Like a right? destabilization of the hypotheses. You got it. Yep. Um, now, what else? What you're also getting is um, uh, a kind of a, 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 that's kind of the low level plateau, if you like. But as you move higher, higher doses, um, you start to get you start to active. Um, sorry, you start you start to see um, ketamine binding to the NMDA receptors on the excitatory neurons themselves. Yeah. So you're inhibiting the excited neurons now, as well as at the same time, inhibiting the inhibitory neurons. You've got this kind of push pull effect uh, where um, the, the, the ketamine is, is it's, it's disinhibiting the brain by binding to the inhibitory interneurons, but also inhibiting at the same time by binding to the ex ex the NMDA receptors on the excitatory neurons. And so this weird push-pull effect causes this quite unusual, and kind of unique, really, um, pattern of neural activity to emerge where the brain actually alternates every few seconds between this very inhibited state, kind of a, an almost an anesthetized state, uh, and then it will switch to a, uh, a, a high complexity, high activity, almost like psychedelic state. So this is the kind of the dissociative anesthetic state, the unique dissociative anesthetic state that's induced by ketamine and related drugs. Um, so this is probably when you kind of take a little bit too much ketamine by accident, you kind of fall into that so-called K-hole uh, is when- or take a little bit too much. 
on purpose. <laughs> we'll take a little bit too much on purpose. Yeah. But often it's accidental, right? Um, because there seems to be a kind of a threshold effect where um, suddenly you get the, 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 the emergent behavior of the brain actually switches. You know, it's quite a steep shift. Um, and then you get in this dissociative anesthetic state. The brain is shifting between. So it's a kind of an unusual state of consciousness. You don't experience it as kind of you know, anesthetize and then awake. You experience the unified effect of that, if that makes sense. Well, uh, what, which you're, is this, what you're talking uh, about is a specific mm. dose range, because there is a dosage at which point it is exclusively anesthetized, like you're gone, right? And then there's a state, right. like you said, where it's like, oh, it's kind of trippy and we're being weird and having a time. And then there's this other state where you're wavering between it. And you said it's almost like a psychedelic state. Well, it's almost like it from a classical psychedelic, but it's, in my experience, it's definitely a very psychedelic state because of how how much of a different reality it feels or like how much of a different experience of reality it is both destabilized yes. and also coherent i did mm. some ketamine um intramuscular ketamine therapy for the brain injury um that i sustained mm. and wow. you know reading your explanation of this this sort of like oscillating from unconsciousness to psychedelic consciousness it like it tracked very well of these sort of like spontaneously coming to in a completely different like realizing that i'm in a completely different reality and then progressing into like oh and i'm tripping in this space and then it it i mean at times it was really difficult to tell like because it's so fast i'm actually it's like i'm existing in all sorts of different worlds simultaneously mm. because it's happening in a way that and I, my brain's trying to put it together. So it feels like they're happening concurrently. I am in this mm. altered, like this other dimensional reality. I am in this other hypothesis of things that are happening that's not actually based here and now. I am actually dying in the hospital somewhere. I am also having a ketamine session and this is all a ketamine experience. All hypotheses are equally likely simultaneously mm -hmm. and are no longer bound by space or time in their concurrent existence and nothing pernines anything in particular. Um, and so reading your, reading that sort of description of the, of the end switch, I was like, Oh yeah, that tracks. Uh, mm, and, yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. The ketamine is uh, the first time I, I, t I, uh, I tried ketamine. Uh, yeah. The word that came to you is it's an abstract state of consciousness. Uh, somehow it, it, it's, it's fragmented. It's, yeah, it's very hard to describe. I think it's one of those drugs that I, I still struggle. If someone says to me, you know, what's ketamine like? I, was like, I don't really know. <laughs> I can't, you know, with, with other psychedelics, I can explain with DMT. I can say, I can at least say, oh, it's incredibly complex and bizarre reality and see beings. But with ketamine, it's like, I don't know how to, I don't know how, to, I don't have the, the verbal capacity to describe this space. It's a very strange, abstract kind of state of consciousness um, that's clearly psychedelic. People will disagree with me on that and say, oh, it's not a real psychedelic, but I think we agree. It's, it has psychedelic qualities. It depends how you define psychedelic and people have their own pet definitions for psychedelic. But in terms of the way I define a psychedelic as a, as a molecule that um, alters the structure and dynamics of your world model. That's my basic definition. Then ketamine definitely is a psychedelic, but it also has these um, curious um, anesthetic qualities as well. This dissociative, where it becomes disconnected from the environment as well. Because a, a study recently, actually, that it wasn't in the book because it was very recent. I think it just came out not long ago, a few months ago, uh, showed that. Um, one thing that ketamine does is it shuts down a lot of the connections that bring information into the brain whilst maintaining increasing activity uh, of uh, neurons that don't connect to the environment. So that's our way of saying it's it's stimulating the world model to build a world and disrupting that world model whilst also uh, reducing the flow of sensor information. So it's in a way it's, 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 um, it's like a blend of what the tropanes are doing and what the psychedelics are doing. Um, it's a different kind of pattern, if you like, of, uh, of activity. So, yeah, very cool.
Hmm. Very, yeah, very interesting. And we're running low on hmm. time, so I'm not going to continue to dig into that okay. as much as I'd like to. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to entirely jump over the case switch, which is the your chapter on salvia and mm. sort of like just leave the listeners who are like wait i i, I want to know to read mm. reality switch technologies if they'd like to know about the case switch because it's <laughs> also sure. very interesting to learn more about uh, uh Sal- salvia's impact on the brain and the, and the world building system um so i want to end with your sense of like why this like what is the function of this model for you like this sorry thesis right with respect to like utilizing these switches in world space exploration beyond just it being academically useful way of understanding the brain's relationship to subjective experience as altered by psychedelics um but first i just have a hopefully what is a quick question which is there are two significant molecules in the sort of psychedelic research world, both of which are questionable whether or not we could call them psychedelic, but they sort of, mm. one kind of gets lumped into the psychedelic therapy, psychedelic research world, and the other one gets lumped into a whole different sort of bracket, but people are sort of pushing for it to be recognized as psychedelic. That the latter one being cannabis, the former being MDMA. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on the switches that are activated with cannabis and MDMA. Obviously, it'd be very different, but uh, wonder if you have any thoughts mm. on that. Yeah. So, with w- once you move into the phenethylamines, which of which MDMA um, is is a member, and particularly it's a type of amphetamine, uh, and it's a, I guess, a psychedelic amphetamine. You would call it, and some are more psychedelic than others. Right, MDMA, uh, sorry, MDA, for example, methylene deoxyamphetamine uh, is more psychedelic than MDMA. And you know why is that? Well, you know the the amphetamine-like effects uh, that you get, the sort of stimulant effects, they are a completely different mechanism. These are not like dopamine and um, uh, neuroadrenaline and also. Well, releasing serotonin from from neurons um so it's kind of a different mechanism but the psychedelic part of these psychedelic amphetamines is probably similar um to the classic psychedelics you know, you're probably activating and i think you know, i need to be careful what i say um <clears throat> But um, I think you know MD- MDMA, for example, will be have activity or does have activity at these 5-HT2A receptors. So it's so there's like a classic psychedelic component um, to the um, psychedelic amphetamines as well as a stimulant comp- component. So I don't think you found a there's not a new switch there as such, but you've just got an additional effect um, that's being uh, generated or elicited by um uh, a different mechanism you know that isn't uh, a psychedelic switch so to speak it's a it's the part of you know um the the stimulant or the empathogenic effects these are, it adds color a different color to the experience but it doesn't kind of you know you're not finding a new psychedelic switch there um cannabis is a different beast i think um i would say that it is psychedelic um i'm not a huge fan of high dose cannabis at all um, but i know people are i know people have wild trips uh, on on high dose cannabis i wouldn't doubt for a moment that cannabis has psychedelic properties the reason i don't include it in the book i think we know actually you know cannabis is quite pharmacologically it's quite messy i don't mean that in a bad way i mean that it's 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 stimulating and activating um, many different areas of the brain having a broad range of effects right um so actually pinning down you know what's actually the the mechanism for cannabis is psychedelicity um is not quite clear so i didn't want to introduce something that i can't give what i would consider be, to be a satisfactory working model of what's going on and the same could apply to fly agaric um as well right you know this is you know reasonably psychedelic in certain some people in certain doses uh, but again we we don't really understand why and that ha- that really is a different mechanism you know you're binding to the 
the GABA receptors here. Um, so we don't yet, I, I don't have a, a working model, perhaps future edition of the book, I might be able to include cannabis and um, Amanita muscaria and the flagric as part of a different set of switches, but not at the moment. Yeah, I, I thought about Amanita when you had mentioned the um, oh, musca, what was the term? Not musca and receptor. Yeah. yeah, that's uh, how the muscarin receptor was discovered muscarin, by yes. isolating muscarin and finding it bound to these uh, types, this subclass of uh, acetylcholine receptor. So let's find this. This is the last question, other than the where do people get your book and follow your work question, which we'll end with. Um, why does any of this matter, Andrew? I mean, other than purely academic sort of speculation. Is there something that you feel is opened up with respect to the kind of questions mm. we can ask by by leaning into this sort of world switch technology, reality switch technologies thesis that you've offered? Yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, whatever you, whatever kind of position you take in terms of the ontology of these you know, space, these worlds that you go to, whether you think they're real or not. Um, the fact that you're, you're able to take a molecule, ingest a molecule and experience for a limited amount of time, uh, a, a completely um, different world, a completely different reality that bears no relationship to the normal waking world, that in itself is incredible and that in itself is worthy of exploration you know this world the dmt world whatever its true nature is certainly worthy of exploration it's um i don't think anyone in their right mind would deny that you know whether you think it's um you know these entities exist you know of, you know from their own side and they're conscious intelligent beings or not there's no doubt that these spaces are worthy of study um and so but then when you think wait a minute dmt that's just one district if you like in this world space landscape there is, you know, and the 5-MeO is another district, you know, the salvia, which we didn't talk about, but that is another kind of district. So you're finding, you're just, we kind of stumbled upon, if you like, these certain areas of the world space landscape that we can reach using these molecules. But there's so much that we haven't explored. We have no idea what these worlds would be like, but we know that the brain can probably construct them, the brain can probably reach these areas or possibly reach these areas of the world space landscape given the right perturbation so there is the impetus it's like wait a minute if we can if we can really understand deeply how these molecular perturbations work uh, and how we can then perhaps restructure and reshape the world space landscape temporarily we can kind of ex we can direct vectors if you like through the world space into particular locations and, and treat the world space uh, like our our playground in a way it's like vr 10.0 or something right uh, where you're not using um external information you know programmed data to, to change your model but you're actually utilizing the brain's own world building machinery and directing it into these strange spaces and exploring you know what are these other areas of the world space landscape like what can we find there uh, you know uh, this could be just seen as a fascinating um kind of expedition of, of uh, exploring these strange und undoubtedly undoubtedly uh, extremely strange and bizarre and rich and fascinating places uh, but you could also think in terms of well you know, what could we do you know what could we learn about ourselves by exploring these spaces um so so i think it's about developing psychedelics developing molecules and potentially also post-molecular technologies um to be able to navigate the world space in a much more um in a much more controlled um less kind of random less relying less on just the discovery of molecules in the natural world but if, once we have a really good model of how this whole system works which is basically the, my book is a first step in that direction i think um then we can we can imagine a future where we could you know 
lie down in a pod and plug in a particular location in the world space landscape and fire ourselves off into that space for uh, you know a shorter or longer duration of time uh, and then come back and so you know, that's how I, I see it. I see us as explorers not of the universe or of the earth as explorers of these vast landscapes uh, uh, of the mind uh, and psychedelics are, are the tools they're the tools for tuning and operating this beautifully you know this exquisitely complex world building machinery that we all carry around uh, in our heads mm. <clears throat> i love that you're giving it feels like you're you're providing a kind of um kind of uh what's the word uh like pe- people have been exploring the world space through novel psychedelic exploration for a long time psychonauts that's not that's not a new premise take a different drug have a different experience but i think you're almost giving it like um you're giving it a a, a level of um legit like scientific legitimization you know in the same way that you know going into the jungle you know 200 years ago or 500 years ago had scientific validity as an anthropologist like what is this world and even to flip it back like you spoke mostly about like what could this offer humanity you know what could this offer our sense of self our sort of access point from an experience perspective i thought of uh you know getting plugged into a pot i thought of that uh, duncan trussell duncan trussell animated show that i can't remember the name of right now um but also scientifically in the same way that the you know the accidental discovery of lsd and understanding how lsd worked in the brain as far as i understand it opened up our understanding of serotonin and an entire like class of chemicals like all of the antidepressants that work on serotonin basically being like the in the sort of the discoveries that came out of figure of like finding lsd is like hmm. well, maybe if we explore a combination of new molecules and with the granularity with which we can observe different functioning of the brain and having people describe their subjective experiences start to map like, okay, so this change here creates this change in experience. And now with that information, what can we derive about how the brain works generally brought mm. like in other areas? And if we discover a new switch, you know, for example, if we discover why it is that Amanita muscaria provides its thing, what's this switch? If we discover mm. specifically what it is that cannabis is doing that brings its psychedelic effects, maybe that's a whole other switch that if we explore psychonautically asking scientifically minded questions that contribute into a field of research and data upon which we could set hypotheses that we explore scientifically, all of a sudden whole new ranges of potential in cognitive neuroscience, therapy, philosophy, all of these things open up. Mm. Um, and this basis of exploring these new worlds and discovering new switches and stuff all contributes to that. So I feel Anyways, mm. you could probably tell in my demeanor. I think that's great. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be the first one signing up for the new novel switches. Although I had my, <clears throat> had my time. I heard Dennis McKenna once say he got asked about, have you tried this drug or this drug? And his response was like, mm. he was like, the psychedelic cowboy life is a young man's game. I think as I get older, I'm much <laughs> less likely to find and try all the new random stuff. But I support people doing so in a safe and responsible manner. Um, as long as it's legal in your country of origin. Anyways. Of course. That aside, um, <laughs> Andrew, thanks for this conversation. Thank you for Thank your you. book. Where can people get more information? Where can they buy Reality Switch Technologies or your previous book, Alien Information Theory? And how can they follow you on social media? Yes. So my main website is alieninsect.net, uh, where you can find, um, you can download <clears throat> the Excuse first me. chapter of Reality Switch Technologies. Uh, fully illustrated yes beautiful um, so you can kind of check it out uh, you know kind of what you're going to get when you buy it um, you can also find the links to my many of my interviews and um, podcasts and um, papers and things like that on there so that would be the first port of call alieninsect.net um, I post regularly on Twitter quite quite a following now on there so i post regularly about psychedelic neuroscience and that kind of thing so alien insect again is my twitter handle i have a sub stack as well if you want to get i have a weekly uh weekly posts on psychedelic and other neuroscience chemistry pharmacology um so if you want to receive 
um, a weekly email with my weekly post then go to my Substack, alien insect on drugs um and yeah uh, so reality switch technology you can buy it directly from my website alieninsect.net or you could also you know just go to the usual suspects amazon or barnes and noble or whatever and you can order it from uh there so it's, Anything it's, I miss? it's if it's distributed by a, a major distri- if it's on barnes and noble then maybe i'm thinking is there any way that that our listeners can buy them f- from our local bookshops rather than the mega conglomerate like Amazon. Um, so yes. just encouraging the listeners, if you can get your local bookstore to order it in, it's likely yep. going to cost just as much as Amazon or sometimes less. You just got to wait a little bit longer, but you're supporting a local business. So please do that if you can. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you can definitely, order, you don't have to order from Amazon. Uh, it's internationally distributed. So go to your bookstore. They might not have it on the shelves. I'd be surprised if they did, but let me know if they do at your local <laughs> bookstore. Maybe certain niche bookstores might have it. But it's yeah, you probably have to order they... it. In. <laughs> okay. Well, on that, again, Andrew Gallimore, thank you so much for coming on Adventures of the Mind for a second time. And uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Me too. Me too. Thank you very much, James and cut. Okay, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Adventures Through the Mind. Please do follow up with Andrew's work. His Substack and his Twitter are really interesting. Obviously, I loved his book, Reality Switch Technologies. So if you're into what you heard here today, or just generally interested in psychedelic neurobiology and neurochemistry, or even just the sort of neurochemical basis of our perception of reality, Reality Switch Technologies is an awesome book. Um, (laughs) <laughs> big two thumbs up from James Jesso. Uh, links to checking that out, checking out his website and so forth are in the show notes of this episode at jameswjesso.com. And you can link through that in the description to this episode. Again, if you're finding value in the show, I'm really happy to hear that. And if you also happen to be in a place where you have some extra financial capacity to contribute to the costs literal, you know, financial and also non-financial costs of producing this show, I would really appreciate that. You could either become a patron on Patreon or leave a one-time donation. If you'd like to stay in contact with me, you can follow me on Instagram at A-T-T-M-I-N-D podcast at mine podcast or on Twitter at James W. Gesso. I also have a Telegram channel and, and a newsletter, which is linked in the description to this episode. These the Telegram channel and the newsletter don't rely on algorithms for you to you know stay up to date. So I mean that's probably preferred if you don't want to sort of remain subject to the algorithm, um, like capital letters the algorithm. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for supporting the show, following the show, staying in contact. Looking forward to you coming back for the next episode of Adventures to the Mind or scrolling through the archives to find another episode you haven't yet listened to. And uh, so that's all for this one. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next episode of Adventures to the Mind. And until then, take care.